Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Saturday, June 1st, 2019. And I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And if you would kindly hit the like button, that would be great, guys. Okay. Well, today I got a video for you called Love Lock Cave Revisited. And the reason why I'm doing this video is because I was on the radio, I was on Coast to Coast last night with L.A. Marzulli, and he was talking about the mounds. And, you know, I, obviously I it's related to my research, and, you know, whenever there is somebody on Coast to Coast, that's going to talk about anything related to my research I'm going to call in. I mean, that's, you know, I feel like I need to do that. To set the record straight about my own ideas about things, etc., etc. So, in any case, L.A. Marzulli was on Coast to Coast last night, and he's of the Nephilim Giants fame. He has sort of a Christian slant on it, the Bible and Giants and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I followed his work. I enjoyed some of it, you know. I think he's a deep researcher and he does get into a lot of this stuff. But he was talking about the Lovelock Cave. And if you've been an old subscriber, you probably know I already produced a video on Lovelock Cave to sort of talk about it. And what my hypothesis about it is about it because I'm basing it on the book that I read by C.W. Saram, which is, he's a very famous writer on archaeology, okay, he wrote this book, The First American, okay, and he more or less was telling suppressed stories, archaeological stories, all of this suppressed information in his opinion, and he had worked for the Nazis in the Ministry of Propaganda, and he knew what suppressed information meant, okay? And since his interest was archaeology, okay, that's what he liked, that's what he was all about, he decided that he was going to write some books about suppressed archaeology, and specifically this one, The First American, which led me to investigate a lot of things that Saram said in the book. And it led me to an hypothesis about the people at Lovelock Cave who were called the Lovelock people. Apparently there was, according to mainstream, they weren't just in the cave there, they inhabited the area there. Okay, according to what mainstream archaeology says, okay, so it's just, it's more than the people who lived in the cave, okay, you get that, right? So there was a people there, a separate and distinct people, which according to the, the museum, the Lovelock Cave artifacts at the Humboldt Museum, okay, according to them, all right, the recovered remains of the inhabitants, although slightly more robust, okay, it's almost a joke, okay, this euphemism that they have here, okay, slightly more robust, robust like chock full of nuts coffee, I mean, what are they talking about here, slightly more robust, well, let's take the euphemism out of this statement here, Okay, they were bigger in size, okay, but the statement here were not beyond normal size parameters, yes, going by today's um, height statistics, that would be correct, but we're not talking about people who exist today you see, and I did all the research on the history of height, okay, and anybody six foot or taller before 1800 would be somebody of unusual size, okay, according to mainstream, okay, academics, that's their take on it, okay, so, 
you know, the archaeologists aren't talking to those people, see, because, you know, they don't want to add two and two together. They don't like simple arithmetic, you see, because I did the research on it. They're full of crap, okay? This statement's slightly more robust, although slightly more of us were not beyond normal size parameters. Yes, taken by today's standards. We're not talking about that, okay? In 1800, the tallest European on average was five foot seven, and that would be the Irish. Those of the English, Dutch, and German were five three to five foot five inches tall on average. You see? How they skew things here, okay? So look, people. I had to call into the show to straighten them out. I'm going to post it. It's the second hour of the show. You'll hear me get on the show. And whether it was previously with Michael Cremo, which was a dynamite one, you know, I got on there and actually Michael Cremo asked me what I thought, all right, as a researcher, which I thought was pretty good. And I was on with Michael Tellinger, okay? Anybody that's got anything out there, I challenge sort of Michael Tellinger on, you know, his claim that South Africa was the largest area of, you know, man-made stone structures in the world. And I would call in and said, no, no, no. The northeastern part of North America is the largest area of man-made stone construction, ancient man-made stone constructions. And to his credit, and I want to take it all back because he was on Coast to Coast just recently again, okay, and he made a big deal about talking about North America. He, made, he went out of his way to really make a big deal about it because I guess he remembered my little conversation with him there. So, in any case, to his credit, he, he gave a long uh, recital on, you know, how he thought it was just incredible and amazing and terrific and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, your friend Budcat7 is going to take on anybody, include L.A. Marzulli, okay, when the facts aren't straight. But before we get into a little bit more about what my theory is about, I'm just going to put it in, you know, a synopsis, and I'll give you links to my other videos that concern this whole subject matter here and why I, my hypothesis is what it is, okay? But... I just want you to take a look at this for a second, okay? <clears throat> These are band cartoons from World War II. You know, there's several kinds of band cartoons. Some of them are racist, but these are more ethnic, okay? And, you know, in these band cartoons from World War II, which I didn't even see when I was a kid. I don't think I did. Maybe I saw one or two of them, but it's a Disney one about Nazi children, doe-eyed Nazi kids being indoctrinated. You know, these are propaganda cartoons, okay, obviously. And you can see the way that they depict the people who are our enemy during World War II are gross, you know, ethnic stereotypes, all right, and this is why these cartoons are banned for kids to watch on TV, although they don't play Looney Tunes anymore. Or they, you know, here's the big fat German guy and the bloodthirsty Nazi wolf. Okay, so you get the picture. Okay, well, why, why did we do that? Okay, does anybody have an answer for me? I mean, you know, I pretty much know what the answer is, but, you know, why did we, why did we depict these people as, you know, bloodthirsty and goofy and stupid and mean and, you know, foul human being? Why did we do that? What would be the purpose of doing that? Does anybody know? All right. How, how long do you think something like this has been around? You know, that a people of any society would do this to, 
you know, their enemies, okay? Why would they depict them as this, okay? Well, you know, I think you know the answer to that already, okay? I don't really have to go over it with you, but the idea, I mean, and here's the story of Lovelock Cave, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, but we'll just read from it a little bit here. I mean, this is all the stuff that they found in the cave. There's a lot of discussion about it. Nobody's positive about anything. It's one of those things, okay? They talk about life that has been inhabited for thousands of years, okay? According to Paiute oral history, the Siddhika Asai, a legendary tribe of red-haired cannibalistic giants, mummified remains fitting the Paiute description were discovered by guano miners in Lovelock Cave in 1911. Adrian Mayer, who is a writer, okay, one of these reptoid writers that, you know, is going to, you know, change the facts or he hasn't got them straight to begin with, okay, writes about it in the Siddhika book, Fossil Legend of the First Americans. She suggests that the quote-unquote giant interpretation of the skeletons of Lava Cave and other dry caves in Nevada was started by entrepreneurs setting up tourist displays and that the skeletons themselves were of normal size. So I think this lady should get in touch with the Humboldt Museum over there and straighten them out because if that's the case, they have no reason to put this in, although slightly more robust. We're not beyond normal size parameters, so I think that lady should call them up and straighten out the archaeologist over there. You know, she's just a writer and everything, but she should straighten them out if, you know, that's how she feels about it. But somehow I don't think that call is going to be made, okay, because she's just the shill, okay? And they're saying in here, however, about 100 miles north of Lovelock, there are plentiful fossils of mammoths and cave bears, and their large limb bones could easily be thought to be those of giants by an untrained observer. She also discussed the regid chair, pointing out that the hair pigment is not stable after death. But yes, can you show me the, um, the um, uh, lab results from that? I keep asking that question about this, but I, I don't see the seam any lab results referring to this contention here. And that various factors such as temperature soil can turn ancient, very dark hair, rusty red. Okay, so let's see the science. Okay? I don't see it here either. Okay, so, you know, get bent. All right? They don't know what they're talking about. Apparently, the museum does. And as I say, it's a euphemism for bigger. Okay? And I go over this in a lot of my videos, okay? But it all started with Snake Town, okay? So, this story of, you know, go back to Lovelock. The story of... Uh, you know, cannibalistic giants, okay? And first of all, I mean, I feel like saying to L.A. Marzulli, I mean, are you for real, man? Okay, let me tell you a story, okay? It's called a campfire story, okay? And it's about these old woods uh, where I'm at, okay? And how, you know, there's a hairy monster man there, and he's going to come into your house, and he's going to take your children, and he's going to eat them. Okay, you ever hear a story like that? Does that sound familiar, that story? How about this story right here? Okay, I don't know how many of these stories, this ancient story... Where this fellow, the bogeyman of some description, because we'll see why, okay, that, you know, the Paiute people, I don't care what the Paiute elders say, they're just regurgitating the propaganda of their time, you see? You see all these different bogeymen here? Well, let's see where else. Other examples, let's see where else they have this phenomena with the bogeyman where a guy is eating children and creature devoured young children who stayed up past their bedtime. Okay. 
Let's see how many other places where they have these kind of thoughts in their head. Wow, a lot of different places, huh? Holy cow, it's just like everywhere. Wouldn't you say? Okay, so this whole idea, all right, that the Paiutes, okay, and also, look, guys, you know, positive bias is just as delusional as negative bias. Do you understand how duality works in this universe? Okay? The notion that, you know, the native peoples of any lands anywhere were just these peaceful spiritual beings and, you know, maybe that's what they are now or whatever, but their histories are all about war and killing and death. Just like everybody on this planet, okay? And the Paiutes are also just like anybody else on this planet, Okay? And the whole thing about the Lovelock Cave people was just a story, okay? That they're cannibalistic giants that eat, come in their camps and take their children in the middle of the night and eat them, okay? Demonizing the enemy, demonizing of the enemy, dehumanizing of the enemy is a propaganda technique which promotes an idea about the enemy being a threatening, evil aggressor with only destructive objectives. Demonization is the oldest propaganda technique aimed to inspire hatred toward the enemy necessary to hurt them more easily. Okay. See where it says that there? All right, hurt them more easily to preserve and mobilize allies and demoralize the enemy. You see, it's the oldest propaganda technique used by people, okay? Any people, including Native Americans, you see, because they're just people. All right? I don't think I have to read the rest of this to you for you to understand what I'm trying to say. Okay? This serves, the whole thing with the giants of Lovelock being cannibals serves both sides. You see what I'm saying? As I often say to Christy McGowan, I'm the, I'm the odd man out, the third man out. I'm trying to give you the real rational story to Lovelock Cave, okay? And thanks to C.W. Saram in The First American, we find out that at Snake Town, Arizona, a very strange people were found, the Hohokam people. And the Hohokam people had all of this very, very high level of knowledge. And they also had a different kind of phenotype. All right? And this fellow, Harold S. Gladwin, who is the, um, who is the head of the um, uh, Arizona Archaeological Museum, he was the director of the first museum being opened there, had a theory about these people that they were a separate culture from the Native Americans, okay? But mainstream, other mainstream archaeologists didn't like it. So they shut him up. Saram tells us about that in his book. Okay? And that led, okay, to me doing a video about the Towers of Silence at Galena Canyon. 
okay, the Galena people that nobody knows about, okay, 500 towers in Galena Canyon, New Mexico, 500 25 and 30 foot towers that look like castles, all right, with megalithic finely cut limestone blocks as bases for these constructions. And nobody's heard about this in the United States. And it's not reported even by mainstream. Okay. And these people had a different phenotype. Just like the ones at Snake Town. All right. They had a different body type that was slightly more robust. And the people at Galena were all killed and burned alive in their houses. Something like what happened to the people at Lovelock Cave, all right, who were slightly more robust. Starting to get the picture, okay? Now, these slightly more robust people were not only taller by a head or so, but they were larger in size, and they had weird skulls that were brachycephalus. That's the artificial cranial deformation, why you would put a board on the back of your head and warp it. Um, God only knows why, but that may be because of the dolichocephalus skulls, the natural elongated skulls that were found at Snake Town. Okay? But after I read that about Galena Canyon, okay, in Saram's book, all right, I came to the determination that the people from Love Lockade, because it's approximately the same time period as well, you see, the people at Galena Canyon and the people at Lovelock Cave and possibly the people in Hovenweep in Utah and Colorado because the site of Hovenweep is called Hovenweep Castle just like the Towers of Silence in Galena Canyon. Okay, they misattribute it to the Pueblos but the Pueblos only occupied the place at a later date, you see. So, <clears throat> my hypothesis is this, is that the people with the different phenotype, slightly more robust, that were in Snake Town and Galena Canyon, all right, and at Lovelock Cave were all the same people, okay? And this story about them being cannibalistic giants is this. All right, this and this put together. All right? And that's what I said on Coast to Coast to L.A. Marzulli. But first, I went over all the research I did here in the Northeast, and apparently the giants, quote-unquote, the large hominids, as I say they are, of a different phenotype, a humanoid, not human necessarily, but maybe different, I don't know, but because the skeletons have all disappeared or they're 
too destroyed for them to put them together again completely. And they don't want to show them to us. And they rebury these things and all that kind of stuff. All right? But I go over the large hominids in the Northeast and how, like, King Mongatuxi of the Montauka tribe here on Long Island was a fierce protector of his people. And his sons, his four sons, were basically responsible for the rest of the Long Island tribes. He was a fierce protector of his people. He was gigantic in form. And he built canals here on Long Island. He was a good giant, you see. And L.A. Missouri on Coast to Coast totally avoided that whole thing. After I said what I said on the radio show, he just went in right on in with, well, you know, blah, blah, cave. And he just ignored whatever I said about the Northeast because the Northeast tribes here, their legends of the giants seem to be um, benevolent and not, you know, cannibalistic, you know, bloodthirsty cannibals, you know, eating people's children and everything. So I think the stories that the Paiute and, you know, Merzuli goes into, oh, I talk to Paiute. I don't care what the Paiute elders say. They're just regurgitating the propaganda of their time. Okay? <clears throat> Maybe these people were pricks. I don't know. Maybe they deserve to get, you know, uh, you know, I think what happened to the people going is that they were attacked in the middle of the night. They were attacked while they were sleeping. And their houses burned these 500 castles there in Galena Canyon that nobody's seen. And for some reason, every one I see is destroyed. Except for the ones that Frank C. Hibben looked at. And Frank C. Hibben's another archaeologist from the New uh, University of New Mexico that nobody knows anything about. They didn't like what he had to say and they didn't like what he found. Anywhere. Okay, so, look, guys. The story of the giant being cannibal, bloodthirsty cannibals is the oldest thing in the book, okay? You make your enemies into exaggerations, okay? It's as simple as that. You dehumanize them so people will it'll be easier for you to kill them. You understand? And the Paiute people are just people. Okay? And this may be a blemish on their history, but, you know, that's the way it is. You got to take, you got to stand up and take it on a chin. That's it. Maybe maybe these people like Alina Canyon, Love Lock Cave, they, maybe they didn't deserve to die. Maybe the only reason they were killed is because they were different. Well, that wouldn't be a nice story to tell about Native Americans, all right? So we can see why somebody might want to bury this, all right? And this whole thing about them being bloodthirsty cannibals serves both sides, okay? So just think about it that way. All right, I'll post this stupid show there. You can hear me go at it with him. And he gets a little flustered by what I say, and he doesn't address anything I say about the research I've done here in the Northeast about these large humanoids, all right, and the rest of the United States as well, which, you know, basically is, the, you know, across the board. It could be anything with any peoples, all right? Some of them were nice, some of them weren't nice. As the, the Vaca reported, he ran into all kinds of tribes, little pygmies, giant people. They were somewhere nice, some treated them badly. People are people. It doesn't make a difference if they're Native American or not. This whole idea of this positive bias, whatever, it's just as delusional as the negative bias. Don't you see that? One extreme is just as delusional as the other. All right, so, look, I'll post the um, 
the show, the second hour of the show on my channel here. I'm going to post this video, obviously, 